people who get it, get it. Welcome to the Geek Freak Show. <laughs> this is no podcast. The Geek Speak Show is a geek culture showcast. God bless the geek. This is the show where we talk about and to the movers and shakers in geek culture. This is now the Geek Speak Show. Now heard exclusively on PKNRadio.com. Now here's your host, Henry. Hey, hello everybody. Welcome to another exciting, we hope, episode of the Geek Speak Show. So yeah, I'm Henry. Uh, Violet's still here. She's just not here physically. Uh, she's here in spirit, I guess. The ghost of Violet over there in the corner. But I do have somebody to introduce you to. We installed the revolving door, not for you guys. Producer Kyle, no, put the wrench down. It's already, it's fine. Leave it alone. It's it's fine. He's going to make the whole thing fall down. But it is not for you guys. It is for the revolving door of Geek Girl co-host that we're going to, and I'm, I'm going to introduce to all of you as the summer months come. Coming this summer, new Geek Girls. The first one is right here in front of me. Her name is Ariel. Hi, Ariel. Hi. Welcome to the Geek Speak. We know each other already, but we're just going to be formal and say, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Geek Speak show. Hello, everybody. It's so wonderful to be here. I'm so glad you're all joined with us today. Yeah, it is great to have you on here, quite honestly, because, uh, well, you tell everybody why I like having you on here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Don't give us your address, your none of that stuff, unless you want to. Well, so I think possibly it's because I first met uh, Henry here at a comic book shop, like you do. The official comic book shop of the Geek Speak Show. The official comic book shop of the Geek Speak Show at Two Cats Comics. Uh, We met there and we hit it off. We were just nerding out about everything. And um, right from that first conversation, he was like, hey, so I do this podcast, pod showcast, showcast. Yeah. And you actually took a listen to it and you said, yeah, I can see how it's not just, you know, a couple of people just rambling on about whatever. Hey, I ate a Dorito. How did it taste to you? I did, in fact, picture sort of like um, a dark, cramped space before I heard the show. And I was sort of like, oh, you but know. But then she realized I actually moved out of my mommy's basement <laughs> a long time ago. It is very well lit in here. It's, it's nice. Very comfortable. He's made a very welcoming place for all of us geek girls to come in. Yeah, like I said, there's going to be a few of them. We got that revolving door in there. Do you hope it didn't uh, get stuck? Well, producer Kyle's messing around with it still. Look, Leave it if alone. He breaks it's fine. It, I can just fix it. See, I've got my go. toolkit. It's cool. See, another reason to have her on here. So, be, be, that that's uh, the new thing coming up. I, again, I'm going to introduce you some, to some more as the uh, summer months go by. There's a, a summer also means convention time. Yeah, it does. It's a big one in San Diego. You guys may have heard of it. That, that, but we also have another one. Yes, I know you're all still upset because we had no WonderCon this year. We had one in Anaheim. I mean, we were there. It was the, it was great. It was wet. Yeah, you were there too, actually. I was. Um, we have we actually do have one. It's not as big as Com. Well, I don't think anything is as big as big as Comic Con. But we don't we don't we have one that's not as big as Comic Con or as or as not big but medium size as WonderCon. I guess you could describe it that way. I, I like to think of WonderCon as sort of our uh, little pet convention. Yeah, well, I've always said, you know, we, we talk to David Glanzer here all the time. I've always said it's our convention, not us being, being San Francisco. But we do have one that is actually what I remember co- uh, comic book conventions being about, which is comics, comic books. What a concept. And that is Big Wow Comic Fest in San Jose. It's happening the weekend of May 19th and 20th. We're going to be there. You're going to be there, I'm assuming? Maybe? Yes? No? Maybe so? I'm, I've, I, I have uh, social Your look tells me, what are you talking about? But what I'm talking about is Big Wow Comic Fest, May 19th and 20th. Like I said, it, it, this is all about comic books. If you like Hollywood stuff, go to San Diego because you're not going to get it here. You're actually going to get to meet artists, real comic book artists. They, they live and breathing. They say hi to you. They, they'll draw stuff for you. They'll, they'll sign for you. If you do want to go there, a couple of things. One, get your tickets online, BigWowComicFest.com or times are tough, but I'm here for you. We have tickets to give, give away. But you got to do a little bit of work for it. Um, I'm not going to tell it to you right now. I'll just say it'll be a hashtag thing. You know how everybody does on Twitter does that hashtag, follow me, hashtag, I sneeze, look at the picture, or whatever they do on, on Twitter. I'm not into that Twitter stuff. Oh, well, then that's where I'll be taking over because I am way on the Twitter. Ariel will be there and t- giving you pictures of her sneezing or blinking or whatever she's doing. But you guys, I'm going to give you sometime during the show, during this show, we'll start it for the next five weeks. Sometime during the show, we're going to give you a hashtag as in we'll say, okay, for this week, when I say 
Hashtag. Hashtag, hashtag. Yeah, that's not it. But when we say something like that, go to our Twitter, hashtag it, or go to our Facebook page, put it on our wall. Follow us if you're not following us, first of all. Just go on there. Go to our web, main webpage. It's all, it's all on there. Um, we'll pick anybody, not, not friends of ours, but if somebody randomly will just pick you and give you two pairs of tickets to Big Wow Comic Fest. Again, this is May 19th and 20th, but... Neither they nor us will provide transportation unless you want to you know, ride on the roof of our car because I don't think we have any room anyway. And we won't give you hotels either. We'll just, we can point you out to one, but we're, we, we can't pay for it. So you got to be able to get there on your own. You have to have somewhere to stay. Um, but we can put you in the door. And it's free. And for free. In this economy, you know, free is in everybody's budget. Free 99. So that's what's going on. Um, what else do we have? Oh, um, let me let me have like 40 seconds of your time and everybody else out there. I'm going to play something for you right now. You tell me what you think of when you hear this. there should have done it so so who who do you think of i should say when you hear those sounds oh i know who i think of okay well hold it right there when we come back all of you will hear from that person the geek speak show will be right back on the weekend of May 19th and 20th, Northern California's biggest premier two-day comics event comes to the San Jose Convention Center. Big Wow, wow Comic Fest. Fest. Big Wow Comic Fest is a comics convention that highlights comic books and comic book artists. Check out some of the guests. Jim Lee, Steve Niles, Frank Cho, Sergio Aragones, Ryan Sook, Thomas Jane, Terrence Zadunich, Jane Weedlin, and more. Visit BigWowComicFest.com for a complete list of guests, plus a full schedule of programming and panels. Big Wow Comic Fest 2012 also has costume contests, an art auction, the Avengers Museum Art Show, giveaways, live art, and much more. This is a comic con the way it should be for comic books and comic book fans. Get tickets and information at www.BigWowComicFest.com. Big Wow Comic Fest. Now back to the only Geek Culture Showcast. This is now the Geek Speak Show. It is the Geek Speak Show. Welcome back, everybody. So, Ariel, that little uh, montage there that I played for you and all of you guys, who did it make you think of? Uh, Oh, I think I know. I think I know. I think I know. And that is... Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah, a little, little bit of everything. We all have the. Uh, we've all tried to make the sound with our with our mouths with the, when we have the, the the first the brooms, then the plastic lightsabers, and now we all have that app, that cool app on our iPhone, on our smartphones that just light up, and that we've got our own lightsaber now. Who is responsible for that sound? However, that would be Ben Burt. Yes, it is. He is going to be appearing at Chabot this Friday, but like Comic Con, sorry, sold out. But they, we do have it up on our link section. There are some more guests coming up for future Fridays. Future, future Fridays. Yeah, I guess that's the way to say it. Uh, so go on there. You, you can uh, book your tickets now for that. For uh, Ben, welcome to the Geek Speak Show. Hello. Good to be here. Thanks for coming on. So without giving away too much, uh, tell us what are you exactly going to talk about on uh, future Fridays this Friday? I'm going to take a new approach that I haven't uh, talked about before, which is to talk about... Uh, science and how it connects with sound design for motion pictures. Um, you know, maybe many people may think that sound engineers or a, a sound editor like myself is uh, perhaps uh, not thinking about um, real physical laws of acoustics or where sounds come from or how sounds are made. Um, but the fact is, I have a scientific background and I've always taken a scientific approach uh, to create imaginary things. So how does science tie into noise and movie sound effects? 
Well, it's an interesting uh, issue for me because my work is uh, daily work is a combination of reality and fantasy. I'm always trying to create something that's fictional. But in order to have an effect on the audience, I have to understand reality. That is, um, the world we live in is full of sounds, and as we uh, go throughout our lives, we learn to connect sounds we hear, either consciously or subconsciously, with memories and experiences, and most importantly, emotions. And as a sound designer creating fictional movies, my job is to tap into that, you know, memory that that all that set of associations people have with the sounds around them, so I can um, fool them and create illusions that brings out uh, an emotional reaction. Now, a lot of those movies that you've worked on are some movies that made me what I am, and, and the audience that listen to what, what we are. Star Wars, one well, little movie you guys may have heard of. <laughs> Um, you also worked on Wally and and uh, the new Star Trek. Most of those sounds, the, the image as you, as you call them, they're they're the directors. They come from the director's imagination. So for you, how how hard is it to go from whatever he asks you to making it a reality? Sure. Well, you know, the, the the beginning of design for the sound for any film is to figure out what's the vision of the person creatively in charge. Usually, the director. And uh, it, I will obviously ask questions, and the, the probably the most helpful thing is if the director has uh, a script that might even have uh, descriptions of sounds in it. That's also that's very rare that a director or a writer would do that, but it's helpful when it does. But the most important thing is to is to look at imagery that's being created, either artwork that might show what the film's going to look like, or uh, commonly, you sit down uh, after the film's been shot, and you sit there with the director, and he talks about what he wants to hear, and what emphasis uh, you would give a certain scene, you know, that uh, that that would fit his taste. So it's always a subjective world that I'm creating, and it's most often I'm trying to coordinate it with the vision of the director. You know, obviously, I can propose ideas and make trial sounds and get reactions and, and discuss it from there. Now, as you work with uh, George Lucas more and more, it obviously became like like a language, I'm assuming like a second language to you guys? Well, of course, in the in the course of doing the Star Wars films, which I worked on for 29 years, <laughs> <laughs> um, it became, you know, clear uh, early on what, what world was going to be created. When, once we had gone through the very first Star Wars film, you know, back in 1976-77, um, and it, in a sense, hammered out the the basic rules and the kind of sounds you're going to hear in that world. Um, from then on, it was building upon that structure, and uh, there was less and less talk as each film went on about specifics of sound. I was pretty well trusted, along with the, the sound editing team, to, um, you know, create sounds that were an extension of the, the already established Star Wars universe. And and then of course there's you play things back in their final form for George Lucas and get his uh, opinion about you know d- does he like it or not like it. But there was less and less you know direct supervision because we we understood the Star Wars world after 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 certainly during the first three films. And so after working for so long and so for for such a long amount of time on those films. Did you find that there was, at some point, there was just one sound that you really just had a blast creating that was just like, oh, I'm so proud of this. This is the sound. This captures it. Um, And on the other side, what would be the most difficult vision that you ever had to uh, capture in a sound? Well, first of all, there are many times in the the 10,000 sounds that were created for the Star Wars films there were many adventures in capturing those sounds, which I remember fondly. It's hard to pick out the most exciting one. I mean, we went all over the country and internationally to gather sounds. We went out on aircraft carriers to record, you know, jets landing. I went to missile launches in the Arizona, New Mexico at, at army bases, and we went into jungles and everywhere. Um, and so there's so many adventures uh, involved gathering the raw material. Um, probably the f- the f- the sound that still gives me the most pleasure to hear is the first sound I actually ever created for the films, which was the lightsaber. And I don't know why it just I had an immediate inspiration for that sound. And uh, 
had made up versions of it before they had even filmed the movie. And so that that one seems to always have, uh, since it's continuity, it goes through all the different films, it's um, it's always been a, a, a special sound to re- recall. Um, the most difficult sounds are always character voices. And in particular, R2-D2, uh, the little robot that was uh, needed a voice way back on the, the first uh, chapter, um, those characters involving special voices are the hardest because audiences are experts at judging language. You know, we, we hear it all day long, and we're very sensitive to the, the intonation of sounds and how things are expressed. And so when you try to create a character that's expressing itself like R2, and especially one that's not going to use any familiar words, or it's not English. It's, it's you're going to have to get the idea across with just expressive sound effects, beeps and boops. Um, that's a, that was a most difficult problem on the first film. That took, you know, six months of trial and error, really, until finally we had something we thought would work for R two D two. It's interesting looking back on it now. It all you kind of take it for granted. Well, that's pretty simple. But back then, it was very revolutionary to, to have a character like that and uh, expect the audience to comprehend it. There was really no precedent for it. Did you feel like you had to build a brand new language just for R2-D2? I had to build a language for R2 that communicated what R2 was feeling uh, or, the, or the idea that he was giving out essential information. And, and behind that, there was some kind of a, a soul with a personality. Um, I couldn't just make electronic noises without um, making noises th- that had a sense of uh, performance behind it, that there was a meaning to it. And that was uh, the struggle that I that I um, dealt with at the time. I didn't understand that at first. I had a lot of interesting sound effects, but they didn't amount to uh, anything that sounded like language. I, I didn't feel that R2 was uh, being rude or he was being excited or he was being cute, you know. Uh, it was it was the process of discovering how to do that that was was part of my uh, difficult education as a sound designer. We're talking to Academy Award winning sound designer, engineer, sound director Ben Bird from Lucasfilm Pixar. He will be appearing this Friday, April twentieth, six p.m. at the Chabot Space and Science Center here in Oakland. Unfortunately, like I said, it's all sold out. Yeah, big shock there. But you can go to our link section. There are some more upcoming guests coming up. You can book book your uh, tickets for for those. And Ben, let's let's go back. Let's, let's jump into DeLorean and go back, not way to the beginning, but back to you when when you were a lot younger. When what, when, and what got you started or interested in doing sound for movies? As a small child, I loved make believe. I loved putting on costumes and pretending I was a cowboy or Robin Hood or a spaceman. And that led to an interest in making films uh, with my friends when I was about 10 years old. Uh, my father had a movie camera, and we started, uh, you know, filming little episodes of comedy or violence as as, as young boys might. Um, my father had also, he was a professor at a university, and he had brought home for me to use once a big, fat, heavy tape recorder. In those days, it took two people to carry it. Uh, and it was a really high-tech, unusual tool back in the 1950s that was not a household item. And uh, he showed me how to work it, and I got very interested in recording things. Um, and so sound recording was just a, one of my hobbies. And when I started making uh, amateur films, I found that I could also create sounds for those films, music or make sound effects or do funny voices and play the tapes back along with the movie. There was no sound on the film itself. It had to be, um, you know, it had to be done live. I mean, you had to play a tape out of sync or as best as you could in sync with the movie. And I, it just was a hobby that got um, it got me more and more interested, uh, filmmaking and then adding sounds to it. I, I never considered it as a career. It was merely just one of my interests. Yeah, kind of like, like like me. That, that's how I got into radio, actually. I, I never really wanted to do it. I just uh, happened to know a friend who worked in radio, and then it was, I was just doing it. And then before you know it, I'm getting paid to do it. So is that pretty, yeah, much, right. how, is that pretty much how it happened with you, or how did you become the pro sound guy? 
Well, I became a pro in the, uh, after I finished college. Um, I was a, a major in physics because I wanted to really, I was hoping to join the NASA or be an astronaut. That was kind of my dream. Um, and I had a hobby of filmmaking and sound off on the side. And uh, I had made a film as I was finishing college, um, an amateur film with my friends. We did this uh, World War I aviation movie, and it won a contest for a National Student Film Festival. And uh, I was encouraged at that point to maybe consider going to film school for a few years. So I went to USC Cinema uh, School of Cinematic Arts and got some formal training in filmmaking. I I still didn't think it was going to be a career, but I was young enough to say, hey, this could be fun for a couple of years. And, um, well, you know, my interest in sound um, as a student was unique. There weren't too many film students that involved with sound effects and uh, I developed a reputation around the cinema department of being the one person that was a fanatic when it came to sounds and I would help other students uh, with their films and that uh, caught the notice of um, Gary Kurtz and George Lucas when they were they came to USC looking for someone to um, a student who would be inexpensive I suppose uh, to uh, help uh, get involved in recording sounds for the first Star Wars film so I was recommended, and they got a job right out of school working on the very first Star Wars movie. So I was very fortunate, and it was quite an opportunity. I, I realize now how unique that was. Yeah, it's literally a, a case of it's not what you know, it's who you know. Like I, And I can attest to that here in my career also, by the way. Sure. I mean, I was in the right place at the right time. And also, that was a time in the mid-'70s when... Interest in sound creatively in, in, in American films was his, was uh, waning. There was a lot, the old guard of sound people that had been around for generations were retiring. And there wasn't a crop of new young uh, faces with new ideas. Um, and so I found myself uh, young and full of energy and in an area which was had been lying sort of fallow, you know, and uh Lucas had the the vision to hire me um, way ahead of the game, you know, even before the film was uh, being shot, to start thinking and gathering sounds and customizing sounds to fit his universe. That was unusual to have someone working that early on in the process, and so it gave me an opportunity to um, develop the sounds as the movie itself, you know, became more and more uh, refined and as to what the imagery would be. What I really love about the story is in in your career is how it started with a passion and it started with this creative energy that you had as a child and then technology got brought into it and you, your dad brought home the the recorder and now you're playing with more and more refined tools and you're getting the training and from there that's building into your career but it still has that spark of the passion paired uh with the technology it seems like this perfect blending of worlds well, it was blessed in many ways because I had an interest in make-believe and putting on costumes, and I was also uh, an avid reader of history, and I loved movies. And so coming to work at Lucasfilm, especially on that first Star Wars film, and then moving on into the Indiana Jones films and on out, it was a tremendous opportunity, and I found that so many of my interests and passions that uh, had been hobbies and been scattered uh, in my growing up and now focused in one place. And my interest in science in particular has always been uh, sitting there. And even when I create on, you know, fantasy things that don't really exist, whether they be robots or spaceships, I always start out with a scientific approach thinking, well, if this really did exist, what would it sound like? How would it work? What would justify uh, the sound that it makes? And, and I would always start out with science as my guide. I, I would be willing to forsake the science if uh, eventually, if it dramatically it wasn't going to work in this uh, fictional movie, and I would go into something more abstract. But science has always given me um, a, me- a way of measuring what I'm creating for the, an imaginary world. Which ties in perfectly with what's happening this Friday at Chabot Space and Science Center in Oakland. Future Fridays, Ben will be there. Again, it's sold out, but there are some other, other speakers coming up. Go to our link section. It's all on there. And these, these next uh, few questions, Ben, are, are actually for the audio files in our audience, myself included. What, which microphone or microphones does Ben Burt use for recording? Do you prefer for recording natural sounds, like, for example, out in the field? 
most of the time uh, I'm out in the acoustic world around us gathering sounds. Um, for many, many years, uh, we I've still I'm still using like Sennheiser four sixteens and eight sixteen directional microphones in order to you know isolate a sound from uh, a noise noisy world around it. Um, I for many years have used the Sankin MS microphone, uh, you know, because it was very durable. It, it it could handle all kinds of abuse, whether it's the jungle or the deck of an aircraft carrier. And uh, having you know, having it compact as one microphone in a uh, handheld uh, Zeppelin and windscreen was always um, part of the process. A lot of what we record is documentary style. You go to some place, a factory or a, a zoo or something, and you are on the ground. You want to be able to walk and move and maybe run if you have to, to, um, to gather the sounds you want. So it's, it's not studio conditions I'm working in. I'm not sitting in a studio where I have the most sensitive, you know, Neumann microphones on a beautiful, you know, quiet room where there's no wind or it's not going to get bumped in some way. So I'm always looking for things that are fairly durable and, um, you know, noise resistant. I've had a lot of success recently, really, uh, carrying around a, a Zoom H2. Yeah. The reason that has been special is because it's so small. It's like a, you know, not much bigger than a, a, a cell phone. And I find that I can always have that with me. I used to always have my Nagra recorder with me, which weighed about 25 pounds. And you couldn't, you know, I would take it on vacations and it was always in the way. But I have learned something important about the kind of work I do, which is if I'm, if I hear a sound that is in the world around me that catches my attention, then I better go capture it somehow because I will find a use for it. You know, if it comes out of the, it crosses a threshold and gets my attention, I better be ready to get it. And so having the smallest little recorder with me can be convenient. Um, you know, I, I think it was last summer I went into a convenience store to, to get a soda and when I opened the refrigerator, you know, where all the drinks were, there was some kind of strange fan inside that refrigerator. Maybe it was broken, but it was making this great humming sound. So I went back to the car. I got my little Zoom recorder, came back into the store, opened the refrigerator, put the recorder on record inside the fridge, and um, then closed the door and wandered around the store for a few minutes pretending to shop while my little recorder was gathering a close-up of that uh, <laughs> That noise, and I know I'll use that sound for something. It's going to be a force field or some kind of, you know, beam of, of energy or something when I'm done with it. I like to picture so, you yeah. like a sound ninja now, like put on your mask, <laughs> crawling through the stores trying well, to gather I, sounds. I like that image, sound ninjas. <laughs> I haven't. We always think of ourselves as adventurers when we do this, but I, I think that you know. For me, the inspiration for many things comes from the world around me. And you hear a motor, you hear an animal, you hear something odd. It's it's fun to pursue it and then try to um, at least learn. And here's where the science comes in. You know, sometimes you hear something and you you then can analyze it and figure out well, why does it sound this way? Why are the the sound waves uh, made by this odd twanging you know guy wire or something? Why does it sound that way? And once you've figured that out using science, then you can apply what you've learned to creating new sounds like that, you know, maybe back in the studio. I've yeah. done that a lot. And once you do gather all the sounds, what editing system do you prefer to use? Right now, Pro Tools is the, you know, the dominant uh, software and hardware uh, package that it's used in the movie industry, and all of us editors and mixers are, are using Pro Tools um, because of its, you know, it's we've been around, I mean, I've been around to see the development of all these uh, different uh, ways of cutting and editing and recording, and, and of course Pro Tools puts it all together in one package. Um, it allows you to do the three things that uh, a sound designer is asked to do, which is record, edit, and mix, you know, any number of sounds, and also to process and to manipulate the sounds and to plugins, and so you can do, uh, you know, with your computer or even your laptop almost, just about everything that took a couple of studios worth of gear back when I started. So it's it's brought the, the technology is now in the hands of the artists, so much of it. It's quite powerful. 
Yeah, you know what? But let me get your your opinion on this. I I have been in radio for a while as a production director and imaging director, so I've been working with sound and with Pro Tools and other uh, editing systems also. I know people, friends of mine, and people who still work in the uh, radio industry who swear by Pro Tools. In other words, they say you have to have Pro Tools or it doesn't sound good. I've always said that it's not the system, it's the person. If you have the talent, the drive, the imagination, if you're using you know, a Radio Shack tape recorder or microphone, it'll come out. That's, it's very true that the key to success, I think, in sound design is your ability to select the right sound for the right moment in your drama, whether it's a radio show or a movie. And it's not really related to how sophisticated your technology is, whether you have the latest thing. I've had, I've recorded some events like, uh, you know, Napoleonic cannons firing, uh, and I've done it with a digital system that's got the best mics on earth sitting there. And I've also put a, a little cassette ghetto blaster on the ground next to it with, you know, a built-in mic and recorded it. And darn it, it's that cassette that I like later the best because, you know, it's captured in a way where the distortion and the compression is more interesting and emotional. And so it's, uh, I'm always on the, you know, what I mean to say is that it's not the technology that uh, allows you to succeed. It's your ability to pick the right sound at the right moment. And it could be a a poorly recorded sound, in fact, is just what you want, you know. It has a sense of being off screen or being in a real place with noises around it, something like that. So it's a sensitivity to um, how sounds will be perceived by the listener that's so important. Yeah, and the last one for me is, is you really love the sounds you made for J.J. Star Trek. Um, as I mean, all you guys here, Ariel, everybody, you guys are all TNG fans. Me, I'm TOS all the way. My captain will always be Kirk. Uh, <laughs> haven't made the transition yet to Chris Pine's Kirk, but probably will happen pretty soon. But I really, I, when when the movie starts, those sounds that, that that I hear took me right back to the original series. Was that your intent from from day one? My intention when I when I joined up on the on the most recent Star Trek was, yes, to hearken back to what I loved about the classic TV series um, and what I loved about the sounds in that series and and uh, to pay homage to it. And so uh, I tried to create sounds that in, it were produced in a manner similar to what might have been done in the mid-1960s. I went back and used old synthesizers and oscillators with spring reverbs and you know non-digital equipment um, because I felt that if I used some of those vintage tools that the result also would reflect that. But also, I had a love for the original series, and the sound was, I just thought, spectacular all the way, so inspiring. And so I felt that uh, Star Trek needed to have recognition of the designs of those original sounds. And so I tried to reproduce things that were similar, but outgrowths uh, in the same you know, extension of things that were related to the classic series. Yeah, it definitely it's had important. That, it definitely had that '60s sci-fi feel. As a matter of fact, some place, some some of the parts in the movie it actually reminded me of Forbidden Planet a little bit. Well, there's a connection there. Uh, you know, Forbidden Planet, uh, 1956, which had the, the electronic tonalities created by Louis and B. B. Barron, was a groundbreaking film which introduced electronics to space and the electronic sound and uh, the. Th- the achievement of Forbidden Planet was the fact that the people creating those sounds were musicians, so the sounds had a musical relationships among them. And consequently, I, the people that did Star Trek, the, the TV series, also recognized that musical quality. The fact that you had major chords or that when you had a c- series of buttons or beeps, they actually played a little melody. It wasn't just random sound cut together. It was put together with a sensitivity to it being music. And that's what I tried to do with Star Trek. And that's, um, I had learned from Forbidden Planet and the original series that a lot of those electronic sounds have to be put together as if there's music, you know, with a melody and an accompaniment and a rhythm. Um, not just electronic sounds, uh, you know, haphazardly cut in. And, and I, that's what I've seen. My criticism of a lot of other electronic science fiction movies is that they have not been musical they have uh, they have they're forgotten 
uh, that legacy, and that's what Star Trek, uh, the original show, had. So I've tried to learn that and f- take it further. Yeah, great, absolutely great job on that one, and looking forward to whatever you do for next year for Star Trek too. Thanks. So again, Academy Award winning sound director, designer, and engineer, Ben Burt. We all know his films. We are, are looking forward to all his films. Um, so Ben, you are welcome back anytime on the show. You're welcome, hopefully we can have you back next year and talk more Star Trek and just geek out about sound in general. And again, uh, I, I, I have a lot of geek information. I better get it out of my head before I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and again, Ben will be at Chabot Space and Science Center in Oakland this Friday at 6 p.m. Those of you who have your tickets, this will warm you up a little bit. Those of you who don't, well, there's always next time. And go to our link section. There are some more guests coming up. Book your tickets for those. Ben, thanks a lot. Wish you continued success. And like I said, you're welcome back anytime. You're welcome. I enjoyed talking. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So now we go from Ben Bird, who will be the guest this Friday at Future Fridays at Chabot. To the executive director and CEO, that would be Alex Swizzler. Alex, welcome to the Geek Speak Show. Thanks very much. Good to be here. Glad to have you here. So, so tell us about uh, the Future Fridays. Uh, this is its second season, correct? That's right. Yeah. What, what would you guys want to include this kind of programming at, at Chabot? Well, you know, if if you've been to Chabot, which I hope you and your listeners have, um, uh-huh. y- good. Uh, you'll you'll know that uh, our primary focus is. Uh, uh, providing inspirational programming for for young people, for kids and families, um, but we recognize that we need to be more relevant than just that. So we decided, and we we'd had sort of a on again, off again um, set of speakers coming in, and but it was never really a formalized process. And last year, we decided to put some more focused energy into it, and we've been uh, very happy with the result. I mean, we've been able to you know, garner some of the top folks in the field uh, on a number of different science-related topics and, and thinking about uh, the future. And so um, we're ro- roaring into year two and very excited to have Ben Burt. We're sold out, sadly, for your listeners uh, this Friday, but um, maybe there'll be some extra tickets. You should check online or give us a call. And then uh, our next speaker next month is uh, Bill Nye, who is uh, a good friend and on our board, and uh, he's going to be a, a fabulous speaker. That's sold out, too, but, again, check for extra tickets. Yeah, and, and you know what, Alex? You, you, you mentioned it's for kids, but i got to say, I have, haven't been there a few times myself. It's also for big kids like us and Ariel, myself it, included. Uh, of course it is, and <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, it, you know, but, but, but w- I guess the, the real point I was trying to make is that um, – we want to expand the programming for all ages, and uh, while we put a lot of energy into our youth programs, we wanted to uh, broaden it out uh, uh, more more widely. And this is exactly the sort of event that I love because it's it, what it's what makes the Bay Area so particularly special because of events like this where you get in the younger audience the, and the education, but then it's something for us older kids, uh, those who will always be young at heart. So right. um, with that. And with these events, uh, what sort of responses are you getting uh, to the series last year? Um, were, was it mostly older people? Was it a younger audience um, or an even mix? Quite frankly, it, it definitely skews uh, older. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what that's about. I, I, I'm a subscriber to another speaker series, and uh, I'm not a young man, and yet I feel like I'm the youngest man in the room when I go to that thing. <laughs> um, it's, uh, but it, it, ours here is is not you know simply old people, but I mean it, it's definitely adults for the most part. We do see kids. Um, some people bring their families. I'm going to guess we'll see a lot of kids, more kids this Friday night, and also for Bill Nye, just given the the, the, the topics and the speakers. Yeah, and, and you know, I, 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 would, I would say this is, again, just my theory. Uh, for Ben Burt, obviously, people from, from my generation who were, you know, we were four, three years old when we saw Star Wars in the theaters. As we got older and we realized, hey, th- this is the guy who made the Darth Vader voice, the breathing, the R2-D2's mm-hmm. voice, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. We do want to want to see, sit there in the audience and, and, and hear what he has to say because these are... These are the movies that, that and Indiana Jones and all those that that made us what we are with the geeks and the, the show that I'm doing and, and you know some of them actually turned out to be people like J J Abrams, Damian Lindelof, people who are in the uh, doing the movies t- today. So that that's probably why it skews a little older. Could well be, um, I, and I think. Uh, uh, I'm particularly interested in, in hearing Ben just because. What uh, it was pointed out to me, some, I can't remember who said this, but 
the what distinguishes the Star Wars films particularly uh, is is the sound. Um, because a lot of films have other, you know, all the effects and everything, but just the magic of the of the of the work that he did, and something about just that um, crazy visceral response we have to the lightsabers and to Darth Vader's breath and all those things and the the whooshing and whatnot. Uh, it, so it's it, it's fascinating to me, um, I, and I think too what that does and it represents is the emotional connections that. The, things like that that we're not even aware of that can trigger those emotional connections to these stories and films and whatnot. Well, and like he said in, um, earlier in the interview, um, Bert was talking about how he gets the realism. He finds the real noise. He thinks about the science behind the noise mm-hmm. that's created, which ties it right back in to how this is such a perfect fit for your venue uh, to right. be talking about the science that ties to the emotion, that ties to the movie, that ties to the thing that makes us who we mm-hmm. are. It's actually kind of epic. It is. It is. And it's all interconnected. Yeah. It- the uh, you mentioned Ben Bird, of course. We just had him, and also you mentioned Bill Bill Nye, the climate guy, and some other speakers. Some last year, you you had uh, some other speakers also. What, what they're all from? They're all not from from the movies and, and entertainment. They all come from different aspects of science. What what qualifies someone, or, or who who do you look for? What's the criteria that you look for for to be featured speakers for for the uh, future Fridays? Well, um, sort of. Uh, you know, we we sort of reach far and wide. I mean. Um, you know, we 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 actually informally kicked it off a couple of years ago with uh, Jim Hansen, who's one of the leading climate scientists and uh, with NASA and uh, widely known in the climate change field. Um, we we you know looking at someone by way of example, Michio Kaku, you know, who's a, a great science educator and communicator and physicist, uh, and you know who wrote a book on on the future technologies that we can anticipate. Uh, most recently, Brian David Johnson, who's a futurist from Intel, and I really loved him because he's on a theme that really ties into something that we're going to be exploring over the next couple of years here, which is that intersection between science and science fiction um, and how so much of what happens in the real world in science uh, started out as science fiction and the, the, sort, the sort of almost mystical, magical connection between the two. And uh, so uh, Brian is is uh, working for Intel to try to help them think about how to tap into that sort of energy as they think about what is going to be needed for the future. So um, I, I don't know that there's a single theme or, or criteria per se. I think we just look for some of the smartest and interest, most interesting and best people we can get our hands on and uh, and go for it. Yeah, we're talking to Alex Swizzler, Executive Director and CEO at Chabot Space and Science Center in Oakland. Future Fridays is the series that's going on now. Ben Burt will be there this Friday. Like we mentioned, it is sold out, but there are other speakers coming up. We have a link up on our on our link section. You can go on there, and like Alex just mentioned, you can check to see if there's any extra tickets somewhere you know, before now and, and Friday. But uh, there are a couple of more, uh, I think two more guests, I think, are coming up for Future Fridays, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Uh, Bill Nye is... Um uh, going to be in May, and you caught me. I'm blanking on who's going to be coming because it's later in the year. It's in September, but it's on our website. Uh, so just go to our website, click on the Future Fridays page, um, and I am chagrined not to have that name in front of me, but there we are. Yeah, you actually caught me kind of cheating, too. I was hoping you you would know the name. <laughs> I can't remember either. <laughs> We're all busted, but that's why the web exists. You don't need to know anything anymore. You just Google it. Yeah, just go to our link session. It's all up on there for you. So, um, again, at Chabot in, in Oakland, besides Future Fridays, there are other events going on. And it's just a cool place to go to. Like I said, I've been there a few times myself, even for some birthday parties. So what other events, special events, or just on a regular basis, what, what goes on at, at uh, Chabot? Well, yeah, c- c- keeping with the theme of, of adult-oriented programming, um, uh, several things. I mean, just very on a regular basis, every Friday and Saturday night, uh, the center is open uh, late and in particular the telescopes are open. Uh, this weekend should be brilliant. Uh, we're looking at good weather and some folks don't know this, but we're the largest public, publicly accessible observatory in the country. Uh, our three telescopes um, are remarkable and um, take it, taking you to a, a, in some cases a, an earlier uh, a time in the sense that our oldest telescope was uh, 
first installed in an observatory here in Oakland in 1883, and yet you're still able to look through it. It's an 8-inch refractor. And then we've got the huge 20-inch refractor um, that until you have looked through that and seen the rings of Saturn, you have not lived. It's just mind-blowing. Um, so this is why so we do the that, show that we do. Ariel's getting all excited over here about. Is me. she getting excited, well, down girl? <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm just planning my next date night. I don't. I don't know <laughs> there about you go. All exactly. You. Um, and then uh, on a on a more uh, a little more uh, formal basis, I guess is rather than, in addition to just regularly being open on Friday and Saturday, once a month we have a new program called Night School, uh, which is really fun, where we bring it in under a theme. Um, and uh, so this week, and that's actually this week, night school is the same night as Ben Bird. It's this coming Friday. Uh, and this week's theme is field trip. Uh, previous themes have included uh, detention, um, I don't know, extra credit, uh, things like that. But it, what it is is it's a, it's a series of programs uh, that we, again, uh, program thematically around sort of a tongue-in-cheek theme of having to attend night school. We have music. We have uh, adult beverages, and it's uh, for uh, 18 and older, but also 21 and older can drink, obviously, and uh, it's just sort of like a fun adult-oriented geek party. So uh, come on up. That got everybody excited here, the drinking part. See you guys over there. <laughs> we understand how that works. It yeah. makes it a, for a fun social night. That's right. Exactly right. And uh, so that, that, that those are every month. Um, and so, again, check on the website, click on Night School, and you can see what's coming up. Uh, but, again, this Friday is a, it should be a really cool night school uh, with uh, the added benefit of uh, maybe getting into Ben Burt if there's any extra tickets. Yeah, like, like I said, I've been there to a few, not not my own, but, but uh, to some birthday parties. Mm -hmm. uh, so, obviously, it's available for that. Is it available for private parties or, or business meetings even? Absolutely. Uh, we have uh, birthday parties, small and large. We we do uh, for, on, for private events. We have weddings, bar mitzvahs, um, corporate uh, uh, rentals. Uh, PG&E just did a big program up here last week. Um, so uh, business retreats. We have everything from small meeting rooms to the availability of the entire center uh, for the right price. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it is fun. Like I said, I've been there to a few myself, a few birthday parties. So it is a very fun place to, a very cool place to have your birthday party. Birthday birthday parties are, are a home run. I mean, the kids just go nuts, and uh, the, yeah, they do. It's just, it's just so much fun for the kids and the adults. Yeah, and you can find this on on the website. But since we have you here, Alex, uh, what, let's get the basics down. What are the regular operating hours for Shabo? Sure. So um, during the week, um, we're open typically Wednesday. Uh, through Friday, um, some, and, and you really do need to keep an eye on the website. During the summertime, we'll be open um, uh, Tuesday through Sunday. Uh, then we're open every weekend. Um, on the weekends, the hours are from 10 a.m. Uh, to 10 p.m. or so, depending on the satellite. Um, sorry, the uh, observatory viewing on Saturday, and then uh, 11 to 5 on, or 10 to 5 rather, on Sunday. During the week, we're Friday, 10 to 5, uh, 10 to 10 again, and then again. Uh, 10 to 5 uh, during the other days. So kind of a complicated schedule. Always, like I say, you don't need to know anything. Just go to the website and everything is there. Yeah, Future Fridays, night school, a lot of other special events. or like, like A Alex lot of said. other programs. This summer we've got, uh, we've got some really cool stuff coming up. There's going to be a lot of sort of uh, astronomically oriented events. There's a transit of Venus coming up. There's going to be a, if I'm remembering right, I think there's a pretty decent solar eclipse coming up later this summer. Um... And there was something else really cool that is I am forgetting. So, again, I didn't get ultra prepared, but I figured you guys were smart enough to know it all anyway, so I didn't need yeah, to. Yeah, I was actually looking at Ariel for that. Do you know what he's talking about? <laughs> the, Ariel, do you know what I'm talking about? The, uh, uh, the solar eclipse? <laughs> there is a solar eclipse, I think. But uh, the transit of Venus is, is really cool. That's where the uh, the moon uh, – no, sorry, Venus uh, passes between the Earth and the sun. And um, – it can be you, we can you know we can we can look at that with the uh, with the telescopes and so you're able to see that and view that and that's a really interesting phenomenon. It doesn't happen very often. Yeah, and best best place to do that is at Chabot. Right at Chabot. Chabot Space. Right at Chabot. Yeah. So again, just go up on our link section. It's all on there. The website is on there for uh, Future Fridays. Super easy to get stuff. to. We're you know we're just a, a couple of miles off Highway 13, the top of the hill. Well signed. Well uh, easy to find. 
Um, once you're here, it's great. Yeah, you can't miss it. So, again, Alex Swizzler, Executive Director and CEO of Chabot Space and Science Center in Oakland. Thanks a lot. We will see you on Friday if you're there for future Fridays. We're planning to be there for Ben Burt. I'll be here for sure. Okay, and you are welcome back anytime to geek out with us again. I'm happy to do so. Okay, thanks, Alex. All righty. The Geek Speak Show will be back in a moment. On the weekend of May 19th and 20th, Northern California's biggest premier two-day comics event comes to the San Jose Convention Center. Big Wow Wow Comic Comic Fest. Big Wow Comic Fest is a comics convention that highlights comic books and comic book artists. Check out some of the guests. Jim Lee. Steve Niles. Frank Cho, Sergio Aragones, Ryan Sook, Thomas Jane, Terrence Zadunich, Jane Weedlin, and more. Visit BigWowComicFest.com for a complete list of guests, plus a full schedule of programming and panels. Big Wow Comic Fest 2012 also has costume contests, an art auction, the Avengers Museum Art Show, giveaways, live art, and much more. This is a comic con the way it should be for comic books and comic book fans. Get tickets and information at www.bigwowcomicfest.com. Big Wow Comic Fest. It's time for the Geek Speak Show Book Club. Uh-huh. Our books or graphic novels. Tell us what your favorites are. Books at thegeekspeakshow.com. All right, so my pick for the book club is, it's a bit of an oldie, but definitely a goodie. It is McSweeney's Mammoth Treasury of Thrilling Tales, and it is, most notably to me, edited by Michael Chabon, who is, without a doubt, all right, with some competition, my favorite author. I love him. I think he's so great. And uh, what's nice about this pick, for my very first pick, uh, is that I didn't have to choose just like one person because it is a collection of short stories. It is, um, Shabon basically said, hey, you know what's awesome about short stories? They don't have to be boring. They can be thrilling. They can be sci-fi. They can be horror. They can be fantasy. And they can still be really well written. So he got together with all of his author buddies and he said, you want to write a story from a book? And they're all like, yeah. So we've got Neil Gaiman, We've got Stephen King. We've got Nick Hornby. They've all contributed to this book. Them, so many others. And it's a great way to test out. So I bought this for Shabon and I bought it for Gaiman. But then I was able to to discover uh, other writers like Lori King was amazing. I hadn't read anything by her before. And now I, I went out and I wanted to find more. And um, it is such a great way to discover new writers is to get these collections. So See, go and, out. And that's the actually that's actually the point of this book. I was called the book report, but the, the book club is that we act as each other's library. We discover without having to actually read it. We discover whatever we did find, and like like I'm gonna go get this one because the second you mentioned Neil Gaiman, Stephen King, I'm there. So it's up on our link on our not on our link section, our book club section. Go on there. There's a link to it if you guys want to get it. Or it's probably somewhere in, in your library. Go go out there and look where it might be there. If not, again, you can just go and buy it. It's I think I haven't read about it. I think well, well, you you've read it. What do you say? Buy it. Oh yeah, definitely buy it. Plus, it's McSweeney's. So for us in San Francisco, it's nice and local, uh, and you get to support. Um, it, it actually helps benefit the eight twenty six Valencia project as well. So in every way, you're doing good stuff if you go out and buy it. Yeah. So I'm gonna keep it a little bit local too. And kind of appropriate for who who we've been talking about today and who we're going to hear on Friday. ILM, Industrial Light and Magic, The Art of Innovation by, who is it by? Pamela Glintenkamp. I think that's how you pronounce that. Oh, I can't Of course, I had to get the one with the long last name. But um, this one, it's not a like it's not a behind the scenes kind of thing. It's just talking about kind of like what we heard from Ben Bird. It's talking about all the stuff that they worked on. It does have the beginnings of uh, ILM when it was literally almost like a... They were all in a closet, all packed together, and then to the mam- the Presidio headquarters that it has now, with the cool Yoda. I think we've all seen it, all of us who live here in in uh, San Francisco. The, uh, it t- this tells you the story. It also goes into, of course, Star Wars, um, E.T., uh, Indiana Jones, all, all the movies that Ben Burt made the sounds for. It. ILM made all the effect, all the stuff that that is eye candy for us. ILM did it. All the stuff that is ear candy, Ben Burt did it. So that's my pick. Again, pretty appropriate for what we're talking about today. And all of you, you know, I, yes, I, I always get them. So ever since we started this, I keep getting emails. When are you going to talk about Ready Player One? I told you guys, first of all, 
haven't read it yet. It's it's in the bookcase. It, uh, it, it's next. I'm reading another one, uh, probably what you'll hear next week. Ready Player One, I am going to read. I was this close to meeting Ernie Klein at WonderCon, but I, every time I went to his table, he was off somewhere else. And every time he was, was at his table, I was off somewhere else. So, like two ships passing in the night, we passed each other. But he will be on the show pretty soon. Yes, I know. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you. I, you don't, I'm not saying stop, but go ahead, send your emails, books at thegeekspeakshow.com, and we will talk Ready Player One. We're also going to talk to Seth Graham Smith, who was also at WonderCon, because there's a little movie coming out based on one of his books, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. I, I, I read that when I picked it last, last year. Um, I'm going to pick it again just as an excuse to have him on to talk about the movie, too. So th- those are coming up. So... Anything you want? I think you mentioned Hunger Games not too long ago, I think, um, or somebody did. Or- I just consumed all three of those books in like 10 days. Well, you're not supposed to eat them. You're supposed to read them. Well, all right. I consumed them with my brain. There you go. So, zombie now. So, <laughs> uh, books at thegeekspeakshow.com, and th- those are our picks up in our uh, book section, book club section. They're all on there, so you can guys, so you can get it. You can read more about it. There's some exp- eh, experts, excerpts on there for, for, about the books. So go there, check that out. That's the Geek Speak Show Book Club. Tell us what your favorite books or graphic novels are. Books at thegeekspeakshow.com. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our next attraction... Comics Commentary with David Lee on the Geek Speak Show. Hey, hey, kiddies. Welcome back to another episode of Comics Commentary with me. This is a special outdoors edition because after reading a couple of comics that I did earlier, I felt like I was going to explode. So I'm outdoors to prevent such explosion. Just pretend you're outside with me. So this last week led to a couple of rather interesting comic book releases, two of them in which I'm going to talk about. The first one is Smallville number one. What a piece of trash. Come on, DC, you guys know better than this. After the ups and downs of the TV show, which I'm not going to go into, and TV, like I said, the ups and downs of the TV show, I'm not going to go into at this point because I don't need to. You all know about this show. The comic book was supposed to lean into it and keep going the further adventures of Superman. No, it's more like... Super Kent. I didn't feel any sort of feeling of Superman when I'm reading, when I was reading this comic. Once again, the most we saw at just like the TV show, the most we saw up until like a, like nearly the end of the comic was a flash of, a flash of heat vision, maybe a, an, a blue cough, you know? And it's like, okay, wow. If I wanted this, I would have just go back and watch the final episode. But then they finally showed Superman himself, and what – gee, what a surprise. He looks exactly like the new 52 Superman. God damn it, no. I, and I just – I don't like the new Superman. I don't like the new attire from the 52 or now Smallville. Now, I will say that Smallville, the comic book, was not without its pluses. They are definitely, definitely going off of the Superman – movie myth- mythology. So the the Smallville comic book was not without its merits. They are definitely flowing off of the Superman movie's mythology. They show Lex Luthor inside the LexCorp tower, and although Lex Luthor himself is actually very shadowed, we do see one of his favorite fumbling buffoons, Otis. Oh, yes, that's right, kids. Otis makes his first comic book appearance in the, in the Smallville... T- Smallville comic. Kind of like that. It was definitely interesting. Now, outside of that, eh, pass on this one, kids. Unless they decide to actually really ramp up the script and the comics and put a good, another different writer, uh-uh, it's not going to last. The next comic that I'm going to rant on is a hotbed of debate and topics. And yes, spoilers here, ladies and gentlemen. Spoiler alert. Thank you. Next topic conversation is Avengers vs. X-Men number one. Wow. I can completely see why they... In in no shortage of opinion, in no shortage of terms, folks, I'm siding with the Avengers on this one. I'm sorry. 
so this is, so this whole story starts up and they let you know that the phoenix is coming back to earth now you would think that the return of the phoenix force is synonymous with the return of jean gray not what they would have you to believe this time so it starts off with the avengers on their side and this plane comes crashing down and the avengers are like oh no we have to stop it which was actually pretty cool and then that in the midst of the debris they find a, a once thought dead nova whose only words are to say it's coming it's coming which if i remember right didn't they have juggernaut do that right before the onslaught series eh oh well so they it keeps going on and they end and they end up finding out the avengers that is they end up finding out that yes the phoenix force is coming jump over to the x-men side and as as i've said multiple times before you guys know who my favorite x-man is I'd just like to go ahead and touch base with this one here. Marvel, stop dicking with Cyclops, please. You guys are turning him from what used to be a great character to a character everyone loves to hate now. What the hell, guys? Come on, stop doing this. From a loyal Cyclops fanboy, please stop massacring my favorite character. I hate it. Avengers vs. X-Men is a perfect example. I'll go into that in just a second. So you've got this sh- you've got the comic as it's going on, and Cyclops is training Hope, so forth and so on. And he's just pushing her to the limit. He's kicking her when she's down, using his powers or after he said no powers, blah blah blah. This isn't good. It's just it's a bad omen. Is that I'm sitting that's the only thing I can think as I'm reading this. This is really gonna turn out bad. And so as it goes on, Captain America stops at Utopia and basically not so much as requests, but he politely demands that Hope Summers be remanded over to the U.S. government because with the way it's looking is that the Phoenix is going to Hope Summers. Now, the Scott I know and love from the 90s comics would have been much more diplomatic about this. But no, whatever writer did this decided to have him blast Captain America in the chest. Way to go, Scott. You just kicked off the Avengers vs. X-Men story arc with a bad decision. No wonder Wolverine's on the X- or no wonder Wolverine and Beast are on the Avengers, and I'm siding with them too. In all, if you're if you're a comic collector, pick the comic up. It's got all kinds of trade variants, whatnot for the covers. If you're not really a loyal comic book follower, skip it. If this first issue is any any sort of indication, it's gonna suck. Until next time, kids, this is me with Comics Commentary, and hey, hit me up with your feedback. Do you guys disagree with me? I mean, do you think Avengers vs. X-Men rocks? Do you, do you have some sort of input that you want to give me? I'm all, I'm all ears, folks. Use it. You can reach me at David Lee at thegeekspeakshow.com, or you can find me on Facebook at The Geek Speak Show on their Facebook page. I'm always watching. I'm always listening. Until next time, you never know. The next topic could be you. See you next time in the funny pages, kids. On the weekend of May 19th and 20th, Northern California's biggest premier two-day comics event comes to the San Jose Convention Center. Big Big Wow Comic Comic Fest. Fest. Big Wow Comic Fest is a comics convention that highlights comic books and comic book artists. Check out some of the guests. Jim Lee, Steve Niles, Frank Cho, Sergio Aragones, Ryan Sook, Thomas Jane, Terrence Zadunich, Jane Weedlin, and more. Visit BigWowComicFest.com for a complete list of guests, plus a full schedule of programming and panels. Big Wow Comic Fest 2012 also has costume contests, an art auction, the Avengers Museum Art Show, giveaways, live art, and much more. This is a Comic Con the way it should be for comic books and comic book fans. Get tickets and information at www.bigwowcomicfest.com. Big Wow Comic, comic Fest. Fest. Hey, it's Todd McFarlane, creator of Spawn, and one of the original founders of Image Comics, and you're listening to Geek Speak Show. Thanks for coming. No, thank you for coming. Welcome back to the Geek Speak Show. So, ready to close it off for today? Fun show today. You have fun talking to Ben Burt and I had, Alex. I had a lot of fun. This is great. Yeah, see, I had a lot of fun having you here. See, I, I hope that this is a, how'd that movie line go? 
The start of a long, beautiful friendship. Something start of something beautiful. Yeah, don't ask me what movie because I wouldn't be able to tell. Wow, you. the movie geeks are going to be throwing things at their computers. Casablanca. Well, don't do that, and you can't hear the show if you do that. Well, you you gotta you, you can't give them a reason. Well, I, I thought you were gonna say you can give them a computer. I'm not giving them anything. <laughs> You gotta. I will give you though, however, Big Wow Comic Fest tickets. If I've been teasing all show, we, we both have. If you know the secret hashtag, and here, right here, I got the envelope. Hold on, let me open it. Here, let me hand it to you. All right, I have it in my hand. I Go feel ahead. like I'm announcing an Oscar. Wait, 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 let me get my black tie and everything. Put on. your bow tie straight. A yes. little. You never know. They could call you to the front. No, but coming to the podium to accept the award for a hashtag of week one of our Big Wow Comic Fest giveaway. It is hashtag comics in SJ. You guys don't get that. Comics in San Jose. Like comic books. Hello. Comics. That's where Big Wow is happening. So again, it's hashtag comics in SJ. Capital S, capital J. Pretty easy to remember. You'll see it. Well, one of us, there's like 20 million producers here. One of them will tweet it in a few minutes and you guys will know what to do. And again, we will pick a random... You can do it either on Facebook or on Twitter. You can obviously hashtag on Twitter or just go to our Facebook, our wall, and, and, and I'll put a little thing that, hey, post your thing here, and we'll pick somebody from there. That's and right. I will contact you and say, guess what? You're going to Big Wild Comic Fest. Again, May 19th and 20th, Saturday, Sunday, um, in San Jose. We're not going to provide a transportation, especially if you're in the Bay Area. I mean, you can get there on your own. Just public transportation or if you have a car or two, there, there Dude, you go. Dude, you bribe or you ride. You're like, I'll give you one of this other tickets. You drive me down. How easy there is you that? Go. That's how you do it. Also, there's a ride share thing going on. You can go to Big Wild Comic Fest, their website. It's all on there. You guys can actually share rides to go there. So that's all on there. So again, the hashtag is... Comics in SJ. Yeah, pretty simple to remember. So... um. What else do we have to... Oh, I've been also tweeting tease, tease tweet, I guess you Twe- could say. Tweezing? No, that's that's not right at all. That's a girl <laughs> thing, isn't it? We're not going to go there. Uh, no, but I've been, I've been teasing all week for the, the all past week about uh, we're doing a new show. It's not really our show. Uh, and you're all thinking, what the hell are you talking about? You well, were very, very um, obfuscating everything. It was... Um, I couldn't understand it, and I knew what it is. Yeah, that's probably because I put it in Spanish also. <laughs> but what it is is a new show, a new version of the Geek Speak show. It's going to be called Two Cats Speaking Geek. And kind of tells you what it's about, but what it, what it really is, is going to be a video show. So now you're actually going to be able to see us. I actually have to shower and comb my hair when I have some. We're, we're going to put a lot of makeup on them. Yes, cakes and cakes of Just makeup. like so much powder. Yeah, but it's going to be filmed at the official comic book shop of the Geek Speak Show, Two Cats Comic Book Store here in San Francisco, San Francisco, 320 West Portal Avenue, Christian and Hollywood. Corey will be co-hosting with us. I'm, you are going to be there? I'm going to be few. there. I'll, I'll be coming and visiting as often as they'll let me. They, they often uh, kick me out of the shop. Well, uh, now they, they'll have a reason to have you there. That's right. They, they do sometimes. Um, when, when I start setting up the cot in the back... That's when they get a little bit worried about how uh, committed I am to the shop. Or they might want to charge you rent. Right. Too. <laughs> and San Francisco prices, ugh. Yeah, so, yeah, that don't you don't want to do that. So, that that's going to, uh, I'm aiming for May 2nd to take advantage of Free Comic Book Day and a little independent movie from one of the Whedons coming out that weekend. We'll talk about that, of course. We'll talk about it here on the show, but we'll also talk about it on the video show. All of you who are here in the San Francisco Bay Area, you're welcome to come by and, and stare at us. Uh, not menacingly, but just stared and say, hey, how, how are you oh, guys oh, no. doing? You, you, you can menace them. They can handle it. Yeah, but you'll throw something at them. <laughs> so, uh, again, Christian Hollywood, Corey, will be the co-host. Ariel, myself, and some some of the other Geek Girl co-hosts that we're going to introduce you to will probably swing by and say, hey, hi, hello. So that will be, again, starting May 2nd. There is a uh, YouTube channel specifically for that. It's up there. You can subscribe if you want, but there's nothing on there. Not yet. Yeah, so you can subscribe and, and you know... Be, you you subscribe early, subscribe often. Yes, kind of like you wait, You guys wait in line at Comic-Con. Same same thing here. So, that's uh, the show next week. Are you, do you want to come back? Oh, please. One thing we didn't mention about you, it's up on your bio and on our, on our webpage. You're actually the president of the United States. No, that would be silly and a lot of work. And then I couldn't come and do silly podcasts with you. No, what I am is the president of the California Browncoats, 
We are the um, the official arm, if you will, the incorporated legal arm of the Browncoats fandom. Um, started up so many years ago, and we show up at WonderCon and at Comic Con. We're always raising money for different charities and um, having a great time connecting with all the other Browncoats out there. It's the best part of the conventions for me. Somebody's probably jumping up and down like you were earlier when we had Ben Bird on and saying, "I want to join. How do I join? How do they join?" Well, the California Brown Coats is we're basically just like the thing that does the convention shows. But if you are in the Bay Area, you can go to one of the regular meetups. They are on in San Francisco. You can go to a meetup on the second Saturday of the month at Cafe Murano and you just show up and like look for people in like a geeky t shirt and you'd be like, Are you the brown coats? And then everybody will be like, Yes, we are oh, and they'll hug you and there might be confetti. It's very exciting. Um it's a great time. It's a great place to meet other brown coats. And then we also have um traveling locations around like the peninsula and the south bay for the silicon gulch brown coats and uh i'll be sure that links go up on the web page so that you guys can find those groups and uh get your geek on meaning she's shaking her fist at me as we speak so uh that next week next week this will be perfect for you there's going to be at friend of ours cartoon art museum andrew farrago he is going to that's going to be actually a pretty busy week now to think about it we have our show, our regular show, then the video show kicks off that day. The next day, there's going to be a Joss Whedon sing-along at the Cartoon Art Museum here in San Francisco. And what that is, is another little thing that the Whedons did. You, uh, you might have heard of it. Yeah, it's it's Dr. very Horrible. obscure, that yeah. sing-along blog. Maybe like two, three people know about it. Um, very thousands, underground, millions. yeah. So, but but they're gonna have it. Um, they're gonna show it there, and sing along is encouraged. Costumes are encouraged. You you can be there. Um, I will have more information. We'll have Essie Redbird who will be leading. I, I guess or will be your host for the night. Will be on with us next week. So I figured, who else so to excited. have on here? I already know all the words to all the songs. And yes, we will have her sing for you guys next week. So I that you will wanted be... people to come back and listen again. I do. That's why. I'm oh. not, I didn't say I was going to sing. <laughs> then they wouldn't come back. So the, we'll, we'll do that. And again, uh, go up on our, our, our website. Uh, I think it's on the link section. Some, somewhere in there are, on our Facebook page, there will be um, links to the new video show, to all the new stuff we have. There's pictures of Ariel. There's a really cool one. You guys got to go see that one uh, that she did at, as a matter of fact, Two Cats Shop. Um, and that's it. That's, that's it. it. You need more. More reason to come back here. And again, the revolving door is installed. We will have more Geek Girls to, to introduce you to. They will come um, fast and furious as the summer months come by. And that's it. Anything else? Do you have anything else? No. Okay, then let's say goodbye and talk to everybody next week. Bye. Okay, bye. That's all for this week. Come back next week for a brand new episode. Now heard exclusively on PKNRadio.com every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. With replays at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. Follow the Geek Speak Show on Twitter at Geek Speak Show 1. Like them on Facebook. Subscribe in iTunes. And listen to archived shows on YouTube. Search for Geek Speak videos. The Geek Speak Show is powered by Collider.com, Ramascreen.com, and GeekTyrant.com. This is now the... The Geek Speak Show.